John on the island of Patmos, when he was worshiping the Lord on the Lord's day, he got caught up into the Spirit. And I'm going to talk to you today about living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. He got caught up into the Spirit and he saw an open door. Worship will reveal to you doorways that lead to greater things. He saw an open door and he heard a voice. It was God inviting him to come higher, to come through that door. When he entered through that door in the Spirit, he saw everything that we now have in the book of Revelation. But he saw angels, he saw worship, he saw all of that transpiring. That was an open door for the instruction of God, for the opportunity that God had before him. It was an open door. Just like God opens up doors, there are also doors that need to be shut. God shuts doors that don't need to be open. Sometimes he sovereignly does that. We attempt to go through things and God doesn't open the door to the thing we're attempting to go through. It's God protecting us. But then there are times that God requires our participation to shut certain, do- shut, shut certain doors because if they don't, they don't get closed, those doors become fortified strongholds or doorways for demonic activity. I didn't say demonic possession. I said demonic activity. You can be a born-again, blood-bought, child of God, have the Holy Spirit, and have demonic activity in your life if you don't learn how to shut these doors. Somebody shout, shut the door. In Romans chapter 7, verse 18, he says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. He's in the midst of a struggle. The flesh, the flesh has a will and a desire. Its desire is to oppose everything that God has for you. The flesh can be an open door into a realm that facilitates the opposite of what God wants for you. If you don't learn to shut this door, it will frustrate or complicate or affect every single area of your life. Many of you are experiencing certain things in your life that are not God's will because you've not yet learned to shut this door. There are two dimensions to the flesh. Both of them are designed to oppose God's will in your life. The first dimension to the flesh has to do with the nature of man prior to salvation. The psalmist said, I was conceived in iniquity. A child is innocent when a child is born, but the blood in a child is guilty. Even though the child may never have committed any sin, The blood inside the child is guilty. The iniquity, Scripture said, of the parent is passed to the third and fourth generation. The Hebrew word for iniquity means bent. It means reared. It's a spiritual force. Every one of us have iniquity working in us prior to salvation. It's different for for different families. But it's passed from generation to generation through the blood. That's why some people will behave like a parent even though they've never met that parent, but yet they have the same mannerisms, the same decision-making process. Sometimes they can go through through the identical situations as a parent they've never met because iniquity is working in that child. It's passed through the blood. For example, my, my family, most of you maybe already have heard this, but my grandfather was a functioning alcoholic. I, I love my grandparent, my grandparents, my grandfather. But he was outside of the house. He was extremely successful, but inside the home, he was, a, he was an alcoholic. He was a violent alcoholic. I grew up in that environment watching that. My mother was a heavy partier. She was very successful in life as a hospital CEO. But my mother was a heavy partier. She was a hippie in the 60s. I grew up involved in that culture. 
I was, uh, I was somebody that struggled with addiction for 12 years, cocaine primarily. It was passed from generation to generation. It was passed through the blood. It was iniquity at work. Often, oftentimes, there were many times in my life I, I tried to actually change my life through count, counseling. There's some things you will never be able to counsel out. I went to therapy, I went to psychiatrists, I went to all these different things in an attempt to change my life, but none of it could deliver me from what I needed to be delivered from. I was able to abstain from certain behavior patterns for short periods of time, but there was this bend on the inside of me, the bend of sin. I was under the curse of sin. Everyone is under a curse prior to salvation. It's different for every single family bloodline. Some people are like, well, I, I don't do drugs. I didn't do these things. But all of us have a bend towards something. Oftentimes, we, we associate our emotions with our right standing with God. Well, I'm a good person. And we base it on how we feel, what we think we didn't do. And we measure how we feel based off of what we didn't do. So we think we're good. So that in itself could be a bend towards some type of thing where you're deceived to think you're okay with God when in reality you're not. Because it's not by our works least any man should be able to boast. And no man, no man, no man will ever be able to be good enough to be able to qualify for the righteousness of God within himself. It's not something that you obtain by what you do. It's what you receive as a result of putting your faith in Christ. Righteousness isn't obtained. Righteousness is received. And, and so I had this iniquity working on the inside of me. I was under the curse, and I tried to change my life and couldn't change my life. But when Christ came into my life, it delivered me from the nature of sin. Salvation is deliverance. It's deliverance from the curse. Oftentimes, we try to get out of a man what can only come from Jesus. Now, God will use men, but it's Christ that does it. Jesus is the only person that can deliver you. He has finished work on the cross, and by the shedding of his blood, by his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, he is the only one that can do certain things for us. He's the only one that can redeem us from the curse, deliver us from the curse. Whoever calls on his name shall be saved, shall be delivered, shall be set free, shall be redeemed and made all. So he is the doorway into the kingdom of God, into salvation, into a relationship with God. There is no salvation in no other name, other person, other thing, other religion. There's only salvation through Jesus, deliverance through Jesus. And so he delivers us from this sin nature. Now that you're delivered from that sin nature... Scripture says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, says, he who has the Son has life, has no way life, God's life, eternal life. You've received it. You've received it as a result of what he's done, not what you've done. When you repent of your sins, you put your faith in him. Repent means I'm going to change the way I think. I'm going to change the direction of my life. I'm going to change it. I'm going to put my faith, my trust in Jesus Christ, and I'm going to so put my trust in him, it's going to affect the direction that I go in life. Some people say they believe in certain things, but their actions don't match what they say they believe. When you really believe that Jesus is the Savior, the Redeemer, the one that gives us life, it will show up in your feet, in your actions, in your life, in your bend. You'll go after God. Now listen, this is supernatural. It's not natural, it's supernatural. His blood, his blood has redeemed us. His blood washes away all of our sins. That's supernatural. It's not just some language that sounds spiritual, but is not practical in application. It is spiritual. God washes away all of our sins. They don't exist anymore. We're supernaturally translated from a place of darkness under the curse. We're placed in Christ. Somebody say, I'm in Christ. 
When you get born again, repent of your sins, the Holy Spirit comes into your spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Your spirit is regenerated by the Holy Spirit. You are now supernaturally translated into Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become brand new. Not because of me, but because of Christ. You're in Christ. I'm in Christ. How'd we get in Christ? We called on Christ. We repented of our sins. He translated us from darkness to light in his marvelous son. In Christ. In Christ we live, we move, we have our being. What's, what Christ is entitled to, I'm now entitled to. What has no legal right in Christ has no legal right in me because it's not just me serving Christ, it's me in Christ. And from in Christ, I have my expression. Are you getting what I'm talking about? So we're redeemed. Somebody say, I'm redeemed. Curse has no law, has no legal right in your life. No curse can legally operate in your life. What I've noticed is sometimes people give their life to Jesus Christ and, and they pray a prayer, but they're still trying to work natural means to obtain what can only be experienced in the spirit, spiritually. So the second dimension of the flesh, first dimension, has to do with not being born again. When you get born again, we are set free from the curse. We are set free from the powers of the flesh. Flesh has no legal control over us any longer. Now, the second dimension is called a stronghold. Strongholds don't operate in your spirit. Strongholds operate in your soul. These operate in your mind. Stronghold back in... Old Testament days or even into the days in which Christ walked around on the ground, it was, it was where they would have these fortified walls. They would have these large stones. They would build these big fortresses, and they were used as hiding places. Soldiers would get behind them for the purpose of hiding from their enemy. They would be used as defense mechanisms. Many of us have strongholds, and we don't even know we have strongholds. Those strongholds could have been, most of the time, have been created by the environment in which we grew up in. We immediately begin to project onto whatever's coming at us the thoughts that come from those strongholds. It affects our decision-making process, our or how we process things and, and the decisions that we make. Stronghold. They would take these big stones and they would pile them up on top of each other and soldiers would get behind them, hide behind them. These are things that the enemy hide behind in our life. And we're unaware that the enemy is accessing our life through these strongholds. Scripture says the enemy throws fiery darts at us. Some of you may wonder where those thoughts come from and we, we describe it as if the enemy is speaking to us, but it's really not the enemy speaking to us. It is impressions coming from the enemy trying to gain entrance through a doorway called a stronghold. That's why some people can have these struggles that other people don't have because they don't have the same type of doorways. They don't have the same type of struggles. And sometimes people make the mistake of thinking because we don't have a struggle that somebody else has that we're better than them. But the reality is we all have some type of stronghold that has to come down. Here's what happens. We often give, we often give devils more credit than what they deserve. Some people talk about, well, I'm just under attack. As if somehow the devil is stronger than God. And I'm not saying attacks don't happen, but, but we act like somehow demons have the ability to oppose God. Demons can't oppose God. Have you not read the book of Revelation? With one word from his mouth, he's going to scatter them into a million pieces. Now, here's how, here's how the opposition happens. Because they are, no, they, are no, they are no force to oppose God. And they know that. So what they try to do is hide behind 
strongholds in you to get you to oppose what God desires to do in you. It blows me away at what some people believe. They project onto situations certain desired outcomes, and they'll try to spiritualize it, but it's either Bible out of context or not in the Bible at all, but they'll say it's in the Bible. I, you know, the Bible says, I'm like, I've never read that in the Bible. <laughs> Scripture says that you have to pull down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You have to bring it into captivity and obedience to Christ, pulled down. It didn't say it, everything that exalts itself above God. The enemy can't exalt himself above God. Exalts himself above the knowledge of God. The enemy can only exalt himself above the knowledge that you possess about God. I want to help you to get to a place where you can recognize what is of the flesh so that you can pull those thoughts down. You can break the powers of those things. Strongholds are created by three things. These are the three things. Self-centeredness, vainglory, self-exaltation. These are three doorways that the enemy gains access that you have to shut. This is the flesh. How do you close these doors? Right here, I'm going to give you. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. I say then, walk in the Spirit. Say, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts or wars against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Scripture says, no good thing dwells in the flesh. Nothing good will ever come out of your flesh. You will never find a solution to a spiritual problem out of your flesh. You will never accomplish a spiritual outcome from your flesh. No good thing comes from our flesh. Our flesh wars. It opposes. It is against everything to do with God and God's will for our life. These are things that the enemy uses as doorways to give us these impressions. The enemy impresses upon us certain thoughts. The only limitations that there are in life are the ones that you create within yourself. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there's freedom. We have been given freedom in Christ. We are free, but yet many of us are walking around bound because we have open doors we've not yet learned to shut. When we close them, we'll experience greater dimensions of freedom. We'll begin to operate and we'll be more sensitive, operate in the Spirit, be more sensitive to the Spirit, have greater revelation, divine insight, wisdom, and instruction from God. We'll see things in the Word that we've never seen before that will take our lives to higher dimensions as a result of accomplishing what I'm talking about, walking in the Spirit. Here's the challenge. Here's the challenge in American Christianity. Because we have been so groomed for convenience. Much of the church world is catered to making you feel comfortable. Because they've been afraid if you feel convicted, you'll quit coming. So rather than allowing God's word and his spirit to convict us of sin and righteousness, We've catered to people to feel comfortable and therefore left them in a condition where they're never experiencing transformation. They look more like the world than they look like Christ. There seems to be little difference in them from the first day they got saved to five years later. Characters experience little, very little transformation. Prayer life hasn't changed very much at all. Still praying about how I'm going to be taken care of, how I'm going to be lifted up, how God is going to favor me. And God only gives you favor for purpose. He doesn't give you favor for status. And, and we, we want God to lift us up, and we want God to pamper us, and we want God to take care of us. 
we stay stuck in an infancy stage in terms of our spirituality because we've not learned to shut the doors to our flesh and it's all about vain glory. It's never about getting rid of the flesh and living our life for our divine assignment according to the will and the plan and the purpose of Almighty God. And so, so here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Is it because we're more aware of our flesh after being saved for so long that we're completely void of sensitivity to the Spirit? And when we experience the Spirit, when we experience God's presence, like today, we're experiencing God's presence in this room. Many people mistake visiting the presence of God with living in the Spirit. You can experience the glory of God and not live or walk in the Spirit. God is really not interested in visitation. Angels visit. God isn't interested in visits. God is more interested in invasions. He doesn't want to come and visit you. He wants to inhabit you. He wants to live on the inside of you so that you can learn to live in Him in complete freedom. So as you identify these things that exalt themselves above God's will, above the things that God says are for you, when, when you experience these thoughts, these emotions, rather than opening up your mouth and coming into agreement with it, you begin to war against it because the spirit wars against the flesh. It's not always a devil. Sometimes it's within me. And I got to pull down the doorway that the enemy is hiding behind. Because when you shut the door, the influence of the enemy goes away. Some of the things that I used to have impressions to do, I had a bend to do once I shut the door I'm no longer tempted. There's no impressions to do it. I can think about others that engage in it, and it doesn't do anything to my emotions because the door has been shut. The sin nature has been broken. I've been redeemed. You've been redeemed as a result of the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the work of, that he did on the cross. There's a difference between why he shed his blood and why he died on the cross. To save you, all he had to do was shed his blood. He could have done that on any street, on any corner. He could have allowed any soldier of the enemy to kill him and his blood be shed. And it would have been sufficient for our salvation. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. There was a specific reason he got on the cross. The cross was re to redeem us from the flesh, from the curse of the law. Leviticus said, cursed is a man that hangs on a tree. Galatians said that Christ became a curse for us on the cross so that we could be free from the curse. So the sin nature is broken. Strongholds have no legal right. But I have a responsibility to pull those things down and shut the door. He tells us how to do that. And as we learn to do that, we get more sensitive to the Spirit. We begin to walk in the Spirit. Most people live in their soul. They never learn how to live in their Spirit. We can memorize scripture in our soul, but it never helps us to open up our spirit. God is searching for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. No good thing will ever come from your flesh. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, he says, For then you were raised with Christ. Seek the things which are above. Seek the things which are above. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. Say this with me. Say, I'm setting my mind on things above. Most people spend all of their time talking about, praying about, thinking about things that are temporal. Very little bit, very, very little of what we say has to do with things that are eternal. Our words connect us to the spiritual world. Our words facilitate what operates in our lives. 
when the enemy comes to try to access you through strongholds and give you impressions, he's trying to get you to come into agreement with what he's putting in you. He wants your words to come into agreement with his thoughts. And you begin to say things based upon how you think or how you feel. I'll never be able. I'm always struggling with this. I'll never make it in life. I'll always be poor. I'll always have bad health. I can never have good relationships. Somebody always is going to hurt me. I'm just not even going to try anymore. We say things that create doorways into the spirit realm. And the enemy's like, that's exactly what I was wanting you to do. We become imprisoned with our words. We're taken captive. We facilitated the plan of the enemy. Is a child of God, born again, eternal life, going to leave this life one day and spend eternity with Almighty God. But in this world, I have a redeemed spirit, but I'm living in a prison when I'm entitled to freedom. When you recognize the thoughts that are coming from the enemy, you have to grab those things. The spirit wars against the flesh. I'm going to pull it down. It is a lie. It doesn't line up with the will of God. That's not the plan of God for me. I don't care what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing. I don't care if I go through what Job goes through. I don't care. We're not living in denial. We're not living in denial. We're not saying these things are happening. When I first gave my life to Jesus, I mean, I got delivered. The sin nature was gone. I never used drugs again. I was on a honeymoon. I had joy. I had peace. The the sky was more blue. The, The flowers looked prettier. Life was incredible. And one day God said, there's things in you you don't know that are in you. But until we deal with those things, you cannot become who I've destined you to become. So now, rather than living life in a state of a honeymoon, now it's time for you to work out your salvation. Work out. Work it out. Work it out. What's in us in the Spirit, work it out. Very rarely do I ever look at the thought of or think about going to the gym with excitement. Very rarely do I have to. I typically have to tell myself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make myself go to the gym. I enjoy it when I come out. I don't look forward to it on my way there. Work out your salvation, what's in you. The position you have, work it out. The freedom that you've been given, work it out. How do I work it out? By setting my mind on the things of God. When the enemy tries to come against me, rather than allowing it to wreak havoc in my life and to control my thinking, my behavior, my emotions, and what I do in life. I don't want to do this. I don't think, I don't, I don't like this. I don't want to be this. Rather than just playing out the scenario over and over again, you begin to take authority. You begin to take control. You begin to war in the spirit. I break that. I pull that down. That's no longer part of me. That's not part of my identity. I don't think like that anymore. I don't behave like that anymore. I don't live like that anymore. And as a result of that, you begin to experience little by little life getting better. Your relationships get better. Your life with God gets better. Everything begins to get better. You begin to have joy that's lasting. It's eternal. It's in the spirit. You begin to have peace that comes from God. God begins to do things in your life and through your life that you would never imagine. You know, you become somebody you would never thought you could have become. You become somebody, you'll wake up one day in your life. How did I become this? I'm so happy that God's done this in my life by the grace of God. By the grace of God, the Spirit of God, the power of God. When we shut these doors, it opens up a brand new door to life in the Spirit. Some of you can never imagine that you would ever become who you are right now. Stop and think about where you are. The vast majority of you in this room would have never imagined yourself being in a church, worshiping God, owning a Bible, and serving the Lord. Look at you right now. But where you are is not where you're going to stay. You're going to go so much further. Christ has so much more for you. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for them that love Him, but by His Spirit. Oh, when you get into the Spirit, you see more. There's more. 
Even for me, there's more. There's more. I want you to stand. I want to pray over you. Close your eyes and let's pray for a moment. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne right now. Every stronghold, we pull it down. Every lie of the enemy, we pull it down. Every unhealthy way of thinking we picked up in life, we take authority over it, we pull it down in the name of Jesus. Strongholds come down. Begin to pray, strongholds come down. Say this, say, strongholds come down. Say this, say, come down in Jesus' name. I pull you down in Jesus' name. I pull the lie down in Jesus' name. in this moment of receiving some of you have allowed certain things to happen to you because you believe the lies that have become strongholds in your mind that's why some of you allow people to abuse you that's why some of you are codependent that's why some of you are enablers because you believe the lies Things are coming down. The lie's coming down. You're not controlled or defined by your current condition. What's going on in your world, your family, when you leave here, you're not controlled by those things. Those things don't control you. God Almighty controls your future. Father, I pray over every person that's gathered. I pray over our online family. I lift them up before your throne right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that your truth, the Spirit, and the Word would prevail in our thinking. Lord, right now, by faith, we shut the door to self-centeredness. We shut the door to vainglory. We shut the door to self-exaltation. We shut the door in the authority of Jesus' name. We get rid of our flesh And we say yes to the Spirit. We say yes to the plan of God. We say yes to the will of God in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, you're in this room and you're not right with Jesus. You've never, you know, you haven't you haven't been saved. You've never given your life to the Lord. I want to help you to do that today. If you've drifted away from God, if you're not where you should be, where you're supposed to be. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. And we're going to pray. We're going to open our hearts. We're going to receive eternal life, forgiveness from Jesus Christ. On the count of three, lift up your hands. One, two, three. Raise it up. Raise it up. Raise it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. I see your hands going up. I see your hands being raised right now. I would never do anything to embarrass you. Every one of you that raised your hand. Get out of your seat and come up here right now. I want to pray with you. Come on. Get out of your seat and come. You can do it. Say, excuse me. Come on. It's coming. People are coming. Come on. Put your hands together and say, come. While they're coming, I want you to look at the person beside you. Sometimes people need help. They want to come, but they're afraid, and they just need a friend to help them. Turn to the person beside you and ask them, do you want to go? If they say yes, say, come on, I'll go with you. Come on, somebody, help them up here. Where's our team? Help them up here. We want to get better at helping people right here during this time. I don't know what we got to do. We want to get better helping people right here. We don't need to let people try to figure it out themselves. So beautiful. So beautiful so beautiful. Come on, God's cleansing people. God's washing people. Somebody's coming right here. Somebody's coming right here. Do you want to come? Come get right here. Come get right here. Come on. Yes, you can. You got it. Come on. So beautiful. Nothing more important. Let's all pray together. Pray out loud with these that have come. Say this with me. 
Say, Lord Jesus, I repent of all my sins. I put my faith in you. I'm asking that you cleanse me. I'm asking that you wash me. Make me whole. Give me eternal life. I receive you. Put my faith in you. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.